There is in this world a quest for the ultimate theory. Ever since Isaac Newton discovered that falling apples are pulled by gravity, physicists have been trying to find unity in nature. Einstein made progress with his theory of relativity, but it is string theory that today comes closest to resolving the question or answering the question. It is Brian Greene who comes closest to explaining string theory. He is one of the bright lights of American physics, a popular professor of physics and mathematics at Columbia. He's one of the top three string theorists of his generation. He's also an occasional actor and a Rhodes Scholar. I'm pleased to have him on this program to try to help me understand string theory. I begin with a quote or a comment about Albert Einstein, which begins this book, and he said, I'm, Einstein wanted to illuminate the workings of the universe with a clarity never before achieved, allowing all of us to stand in awe of its sheer beauty and elegance. Welcome to the broadcast. Thank you. What is it you're after? Well, the basic goal of the current generation of physicists that are following along the path initially set down by Einstein is basically to find the master equation that single overarching principle which can describe the universe on its largest of scales and on its tiniest of scales and that way really give us a theory of everything in the universe is there one simple not simple one equation that will explain everything well we think that the answer to that is likely to be yes and this new theory string theory may well provide us with that single all-encompassing equation it's very much a work in progress but the last 15 years of research give us very strong hope that it truly will realize its promise of the unified theory that Einstein sought but didn't find. All right. If we find it, and if the string theory explains it all and is the connection that enables us to get our hands around this single theory, what does it do for us other than simply solving an intellectual puzzle? It does a lot for us. For instance, one of the most pressing questions in theoretical physics is to understand the Big Bang, cosmology, how the universe began and got to be the way that we view it in the heavens. And without a theory of everything, that is, a theory that can talk about the universe when it's in incredibly extreme conditions, when it's very hot, very dense, very massive, we won't be able to ever truly understand why there was a Big Bang and how the universe evolved from then until now. So that's one of the key things that the theory of everything will give us. Other things, it will give us understanding of black holes and other exotic phenomena in the universe. And in this way, it will truly give us a shining light to illuminate nature and give us a true understanding of why it is that the world is the way we perceive it. And then we'll be able to answer questions like, for example, you know, what's the rest of the universe we don't know anything about? about? Sure, absolutely. You know, there are a lot of speculations on multiple universes that are existing in parallel with the one that we currently inhabit and a theory such as this can give us insight into whether these are musings of science fiction or truly part of science as we know it. Since Albert Einstein was involved in this, um, considered at the time and I guess since one of the smartest human beings to inhabit the planet, uh, is this the holy grail for physicists like you and so many others to find this equation. Absolutely. This is the deepest problem in modern theoretical physics and students, graduate students, postdoc, faculty around the country and around the world are all vigorously pursuing trying to find this rich nugget of information, this rich theory, this rich equation which will describe the universe. How far off are we? That's a tough question. Um, we've made a tremendous amount of progress in the last 15 years, more than anybody in their wildest dreams would have imagined possible. But there's a way to go. And what we now know is that superstring theory, we believe, is paving the way. It's really showing us the direction towards that final explanation of everything. But it could be five, it could be ten, it could be a hundred years before we know whether this theory truly is the theory of everything. Have we in the past thought we had it? thought we were close, and it turned out to be much more complex than we imagined. Yeah, absolutely. In the, the turn of the previous century, there were some physicists who thought that physics was basically over and a few details were all that remained. And that was before relativity, that was before quantum mechanics, that was before any of the real deep puzzles and structures in the universe were really laid bare. So it's right, it's, it's possible that we are fooling ourselves, but this is the first theory in the history of physics which doesn't need anything else for it to make sense. This is a theory that could describe everything, and that's something that all previous attempts at having a final theory could not claim. 
Einstein died without finding it, obviously. Uh, did he consider the last 30 years of life it, to be his single obsessive goal? Yeah, his, his single goal was to find this, this final theory. And at that time, he was basically the only one pursuing it. So much so that he wrote in a letter to a friend something like, I've become a lonely old chap who's displayed as a curiosity now and then because I don't wear socks. So he really was ostracized in a way from the mainstream community for this pursuit. But now we see that he was merely ahead of his time, as always, and his dream is the dream of most theoretical physicists today. Stephen Hawking, uh, is he a theoretical physicist? Absolutely, yeah. And is he working on the same issue? He's working, Question. yeah, he's working on related issues. He, for a while, was very much against string theory. But after 94, 95, breakthroughs in the field convinced even Stephen Hawking that this really is likely the way to go. And he now does attend the annual strings conference and does give talks in the conference. So it has his blessing now. And I believe this is at least part of what his research is about. What I'm trying to set up is this notion of why this is important, first of all. See, right. <laughs> before I have you try to, no, have you explain it to me and me try to understand it. So have a go at explaining to me what string theory is. Sure. The basic idea is pretty simple. If you take any object, for instance, the tabletop, and magnify it and examine it on very small scales, there'll be molecules and atoms. And if you look at the atoms and magnify them, you'll see that there's a nucleus, protons and neutrons, surrounded by orbiting electrons. And in 1968, we learned that if you magnify a proton, there's yet further substructure. The Russian dolls continue. Inside, there are three quarks, even smaller particles. Now, for a long time, people thought quarks and electrons were all there was, together with a few other exotic particles that make up the universe. String theory comes along and says, actually, there's one more level of substructure. If you examine an electron or examine a quark in incredibly fine resolution, you'll find that there's a single loop of vibrating energy that we call a string. And that's the idea of string theory, that all of the particles in the universe are different ways in which a fundamental loop of energy can vibrate. Mm -hmm. So much like a violin string can play a C, it can play an A sharp, different notes that our ear senses, different tones, the different ways that these fundamental strings vibrate correspond to the different particles of nature. An electron is like a C, a quark is like an A sharp, and so forth. We, we know that there are these four dimensions. We know that there's height. We know there's width, we know there is length, and we know there's time, right? That's right. There's the four. Right. String theory brings six new dimensions. Yeah, at least six. At least maybe, six. maybe seven. Maybe, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what are they? Well, they're actually of a similar character to the ones that we're familiar with. They're just very tiny. And actually, I have a, a small prop that I like oh, to use man, I love to, show to, and tell. To, to, to describe this. <laughs> right. So forget about the universe for a moment and let's just look at this piece of wire. Now from very far away, this wire would look like it's one dimensional in that, for instance, if a little ant was living on it, you'd say, well, it can move left and right along the wire, but that's it. There's only one possibility. Yeah. But then as you get closer to the wire, you realize that there's a second curled up circular dimension, the circular girth of the right, wire. Right. And therefore, our microscopic ant can not only go back and forth, it can also walk around the wire, yeah. a second curled up dimension. And what this little example alerts us to is that dimensions come in two varieties. They can be obvious and long mm -hmm. and easy to see, or they can be tiny and curled up and more difficult to detect, like the circular girth of the wire. Now, what the idea is, according to string theory, is that the fabric of the universe is much like this piece of wire, and that there are the familiar dimensions that you refer to, left, right, back, forth, up and down, and also time, but there can be additional dimensions that are tightly curled up, like the circular girth of the wire, and are so small that we haven't seen them yet, because we don't have sufficient magnifying instruments to actually peer down into the nooks and crannies of the spatial fabric and see these extra dimensions. But string theory says that they absolutely have to be there. There are at least six, as you mentioned, and quite possibly seven that are curled up into the fabric of the universe. Is this such a hard idea to tackle that there may be 10 people doing it in the world? Or is this something that there is every young physicist on every campus in America thinks that I'm going to find the answer to the riddle of unity in nature? It's more like the latter. These ideas seem abstract at first. But when you do phrase them in the language of mathematics, you find that it's actually not that difficult to describe all these extra dimensions. And graduate students across the country are learning about string theory and doing research, some of it cutting-edge research on the theory. 
How do you go about the investigation? Now, I'm, can I imagine you sitting in front of a computer doing thousands and thousands and thousands of equations? That, that's close to it. Certain projects do require a computer to do the analysis. Other times it's really a pen and paper and it's just manipulating symbols which describe these extra dimensions or which describe the looking strings. Looking for what? Well, what we're looking for is a coherence in the equations which will show us that we actually have a theory that is number one self-consistent and number two actually describes our world. It could be that you come upon a wonderful theory that describes gravity and quantum mechanics and all the things around us, but it misses. It's a near miss. Right. For instance, it might predict that the electron weighs ten times what it actually does. If that's the case, you have to throw, throw the theory out, out no the good. window. That's right. So what a lot of us are doing is trying to extract observable physics from this theory and compare it with experiment. That's the goal, and we're a bit far from it, but that's what we're trying now, to do. What a bummer would it be if you think you found it, and it tests well here, it tests well here, it tests well here, it tests well, and then you get to, like, your 999th test to see if it fits. It doesn't fit. Yeah, it would be quite a bummer. It would be a real drag, <laughs> but that's sort of what science is about. You know, yeah, you give it your best shot. Yeah. yeah and and where are you in this? The particular work that yeah. I do? What I tend to do is focus upon these extra dimensions. Yeah. And I've been focusing on ways in which they can evolve that Einstein wouldn't have thought possible. It turns out that string theory says that space itself can tear apart and reconnect in a number of complicated ways that Einstein would have thought impossible based upon his pre-string theory understanding of the way the universe evolves. So that's my specialty. Okay, now if I could get together in this room ten of the smartest physicists in the world, would nine out of the ten believe that string theory will explain this one great equation that will explain all of nature? Well if, you let, out of ten. well, if you let me pick the ten, I could make it ten out of ten, actually. Well, just say um, ten really smart ones. I mean, for example, ten years ago, Stephen Hawking, if right. he was in a room, would not agree. Yeah. You know, are there still people that are not convinced that have the mental agility of Stephen Hawking? Sure. There are a few, but it's really becoming a minority group that are the decriers of string theory. In the early 80s when string theory made a big splash, there were many people who said this is just a fad, it's just the beginning of something that's going to go away. Right. But we're now in 1999 and 15 years of research and success has shown us that string theory is really part of mainstream theoretical physics. So yeah, I'd say 90% is a good guess. All right, this is what they said. We got, we became aware of you because of, of New York Magazine. Uh, they did a story a couple of weeks ago in which uh, it's called, he's got, the wor he's got the world on a string. String theory is the hottest development in physics since Stephen Hawking first peered into a, a black hole and Columbia physicist Brian Greene is one of the few people who can explain it. <laughs> he also acts in Pinter plays and packs lecture halls and his new book, The Elegant Universe, is getting rapturous advanced reviews. Has the theory of everything finally found the spokesman it deserves? I mean, is that where you might be about being the spokesman for the theory that will explain everything? Yeah, I don't really see it that way. I mean, I, I really wanted to write this book because I, I see modern physics as following a 2,000 year long quest to understand how the universe works. And it's become so technical that people who aren't trained can't really follow the developments. And I think it's something that should be shared. It should be out there. These are incredibly exciting ideas and anybody who wants to know about them should be able. But I, I'm a physicist at heart and doing the research is really the thing that I'm about. Well, here's what else they say about you in New York Magazine. He's a great communicator. He's charismatic. He's clearly at the top of the heat intellectually. So the fact that he has gobs of raw physical appeal on top of that, it gives him a really serious mystique. How did you come to uh, wanting to be involved in the answer to one of the fundamental questions of the universe? Yeah, that, that question I, I, I've thought about now and then, and I think it really goes back and I think they even mentioned in the article, when I was, I don't know, 13 or 14, having those existential crises that adolescents do, you know, what's it all about, why <laughs> yeah, right. are we here? Right. And, and it just occurred to me that so many people, much smarter than I, had thought about these questions through the ages and hadn't come up with very much. Yeah. So it was unlikely that I was going to contribute anything to the answers, but I figured maybe I can just understand the questions at a real deep level, and that will be the closest that I can come to try to be comfortable with it. Is being able to do this about having a humongous IQ or is it something else? In other words, is it some element of great intellect that gives someone the capacity to engage in these kinds of very, very difficult questions? I think, I think a lot of it's hard work. That's, I think that's really what it comes down to. I mean, to tell you the truth, I find everything difficult, you know, and, and therefore 
doing physics, which is inherently difficult, seemed to be a natural thing to do since why not work on Can something of that sort? Can you program a VCR? No, I can't program a VCR <laughs> at all. I've, ne well, I've never tried, but I don't think I could. Can you? Certainly can't do a CD player. <laughs> you can't do a CD no, player. No, no. Can't, do, do you do the New York Times puzzle? My girlfriend does. I don't. You don't do that no, either. No. So verbal skills are not necessarily equivalent to yeah. mathematical skills. Yeah, they're, they're, right? not, they're not the same. How well do we do on our college boards? We meaning me? Yes. <laughs> I guess I did okay. <laughs> now, if you had it to do all over, okay, and you wouldn't be this sort of on, you know, on the rise, brilliant young physicist looking to find the answer to one of the world's great questions, would you have been something else like an actor? Because you're now taking acting lessons. Right. I, I think that my calling really is in physics. You know, now how I, do you know that? Well, I guess it's just a gut feeling that what you're after is that which has a chance of being eternal, that which has a chance of really answering age-old questions and will stick around for time immemorial. And physics is really the subject that deals with these questions and has a chance of having that kind of eternal impact. Back to what Einstein said. Sure. Uh, he wanted to eliminate the workings of the universe with a clarity never before achieved, allowing us all to stand in awe of its sheer beauty and elegance. Is that the way you find the universe? Yeah. Sheer beauty and elegance. Yeah. The, the more you look at the universe, especially through the eyes of these modern theories, you see that it's put together with such grace, such sleek simplicity, but yet incredible power that can describe the universe from quarks in the subatomic microcosmos out to the farthest reach of the cosmos itself. And that's really breathtaking. And, and what of those who say must have been the work of God? It might, it might have been. There's a tremendous amount of room in these theories for theological intervention, if one will. The only way in which string theory or physics in general has any impact on religion, in my opinion, is if one has a very limited notion of God, such as some people in the field call it God of the gaps, when you use God to describe those things that we haven't yet figured out, right. well then when science figures it out, God gets kind of squeezed to the, yeah. to the outskirts. But when you think about God as, as giving meaning, well there's nothing in physics that really gives meaning. It doesn't answer the questions with a capital W. Why? Why is the universe the way it is? And why are there people and why is there life? And I think there's where theological explanations are way ahead of science and probably always will be. It's great to meet you. Great meeting you. Thank you. The book is called The Elegant Universe, Super Strings, Hidden Dimensions, and the Quest for the Ultimate Theory. Back in a moment. Stay with us.